Hello and welcome. My name is Keith Barker, and in this office hour, we're going to focus on OSPF. And I'm trying something new, and if it turns into a thing, we'll keep it going. So for the office hour, which I hold every single week, I'm going to do a quick tutorial on some topic. Today it's OSPF. And then what we'll do is uh, present it. I'll do a live premiere at the same time, 10 o'clock a.m. Pacific time every Saturday. And then immediately following, approximately 10.30 Pacific time, we'll jump into Discord. So if you have any questions, we can go in the Office Hours voice room and chat about it, lab it up, and answer your questions regarding either this topic, which is OSPF today, or anything else we've covered in the Office Hour. So without further ado, welcome to the Office Hour. Let's get to work with OSPF. And let's use this topology as a discussion. I'm using Packet Tracer. This is version like 8.x. It is free if you're not using it yet and you're a CCNA candidate, you want to get this so you can practice hands-on with the technologies that we're talking about. So as we take a look at this topology, let's discuss what would be required for the client down here at dot 50 to be able to reach this server over here at dot 100. And all the routers in the path, they need to cooperate. They need to take a packet, be able to forward it in the correct direction, both to the server from the client and also from the server back to the client. So to start off, I've got IP addresses already in place on all the interfaces, but there's no routing protocols yet. Each router, they basically know what they know. For example, if we live down a street, we know how to get to that street because we are directly connected to that street. And that's the same thing with the router. If it's got a, a layer three interface of any type and it has an IP address on that interface, that router believes on that interface that it's directly connected to that network. So if we take a look at router one real quick, router one knows about three networks at least. So router one is connected to the 1010 network, it's directly connected to the 1013 network, and also it's directly connected to the 10.12 network. And as a result, if we looked at its routing table, it would say, yep, I know how to get to the 1013 network and the 1012 and the 101, they're all directly connected. And to verify that, we can just bring up a CLI for router one. Again, this is just in Packet Tracer. And if we did the command show IP route, that says, please show me your IP routing table. We'll press enter. And sure enough, it thinks it's directly connected to the 10.1.0 network, which is right here. It's connected to the 10.12.0 network, which is right here. And it's directly connected to the 10.13.0 network, which is right here. It also has a loopback interface, a logical layer three interface that has this IP address. So it also believes it's connected to the 1111 network as well. But here's one of the challenges with router one. It only knows how to reach those networks that it is directly connected to. It doesn't know about this network out here, 1045, or this network, 23.1.2, or any of these networks that are in between here that it's not directly connected to. So if the client sent a packet, and let's say the client's using this router as its default gateway, if the client sends a packet to 23.1.2.100, and this router gets it, it's gonna look at its routing table and say, oh, bummer, I have no, <laughs> it doesn't have a default route, it doesn't know how to get to that network. And so unfortunately, it's gonna send a message back to the client saying, oh, I'm so sorry, I couldn't get there. I didn't know how to do it. So there's a couple ways of solving this problem. And one way is to go to each router and manually configure what's known in the business as a static route. And these are painful. And why are they painful? Because they take some doing. It takes either a human or a machine or something to implement static routes. And so we'd go to R1 and say, hey, dear Mr. R1, to get to this network, 23.1.2, uh, go ahead and use your good buddy R3 as the next hop or R2 as the next hop. Either way would work. And then we'd also have to go to router 2 and router 3 and tell them the same thing. Hey, dear Mr. Router 2 and router 3, to get to the 23.1.2 network, your next hop should be, well, for R2, it'd be this way. And for R3, it'd be this way. And then we'd go to router 4 and we'd tell router 4, hey, to get to the 23.1.2, go ahead and use R5 as the next hop. And can you see how painful it is? And that's just for one direction. Now, for traffic going back this direction, we'd have to have static routes for all that too. And so the static routes are a pain in the Bazinski. And that's why we're not gonna use static routes very often as our dominant method for training our routers on how to forward packets. Instead, we're gonna use something that is dynamic. And you may ask the question, what do you mean, Keith, dynamic? Well, if we have something that's dynamic, we can train the routers to find out who they're you know, connected to or other routers in the area, and we can go ahead and have them automatically share information with each other. Think of it like having a giant map of the entire terrain and each router has a little portion of that, meaning the networks they're directly connected to. And that way, if each router has their own little knowledge of where things are, and we share all of that with all the other routers, then every router is gonna say, oh, I have a full picture of this whole area, this whole network. And with the dynamic routing protocol in place, each router then with a full picture of the puzzle of the map, 
would then understand based on this routing table on how to forward to get that packet one hop, one device closer to that destination network. And although there's a few flavors of dynamic routing protocols, what we are going to talk about today is OSPF, which stands for Open Shortest Path First. But the most important part for OSPF is that it's dynamic and that if we run this OSPF routing protocol on all of our routers, they can share information with each other and figure all of them can figure out how to forward to every network in the topology based on all of them running this little program called OSPF. Think of OSPF as a, it is a dynamic routing protocol, but it's actually a process, a little program that each router is going to run that tells it, okay, you're playing this game called OSPF. Go ahead and start sharing and learning from your neighbors. Neighbors referring to other routers that are directly connected to common networks. And when I think about OSPF and getting it going on these devices, I think how awesome it is. Let's call it rad. It's so rad. <laughs> I did grow up in Southern California, but I don't recall myself saying rad a whole bunch. Anyway, uh, think about OSPF as being rad. Oh, that's so cool. It's rad. And you might say, well, Keith, how is that going to help us? That's going to remind us of the basic three things that we need to do to get our devices, our routers running and working in an OSPF environment. And for this acronym of RAD, the R represents run, as in run OSPF. So we want to go ahead and tell each router that it's going to run OSPF. And here's how we do that. Let's do it right here on R1. So in R1, we'll go to configuration mode with configure space terminal or config T for short. And then we'll type in router space and then we'll do a question mark. And if we want to run the program called OSPF, we type in router space OSPF space, and then we have to give it a process ID. Now, you could, it's possible to run multiple instances of OSPF, but I mean, hey, if you're playing solitaire on your phone or some other game, how many instances do you need, really? Usually just one. And so that's what we're going to do here, here on this router. We're going to run OSPF just once, and we can specify a process ID for it. And we can pick any number between 1 and 65,535 inclusively. So let's pick process ID 7. How about that? And press Enter. So that process ID is just for the local router to keep track of that application, this OSPF routing process. And that leads us to the next step in our RAD process. The A represents adding interfaces. And when I'm talking about adding interfaces, I'm talking about adding layer three interfaces and telling those interfaces, hey, uh, we care about you and we want you to play this game with us called OSPF. So right now on R1, because we're running OSPF, by default, we're not including any interfaces, meaning no interfaces are enabled for OSPF. And we can verify that by simply doing a quick show command. Now, because I'm in configuration mode, specifically router configuration mode, I'm adding the do statement just so that I can run like a show command without having to exit all the way out and come all the way back, save myself a little bit of time. One negative of doing a do is that the context sensitive help isn't going to be too helpful. So you have to actually know the command. So I'm going to type in do show IP OSPF interface and press enter. And it says, you got nothing. There's no interfaces that are participating as part of OSPF. If we do a do show IP OSPF and press enter, we can see that OSPF is running, but none of the interfaces on R1 are participating, meaning we're not including the networks that they're directly connected to. We're not going to be able to find neighbors or share information because we don't yet have any interfaces enabled. So there's two different ways of enabling interfaces in an OSPF speaking router like R1. One way is to use a network statement. And a network statement goes like this. We're in router configuration mode. We type in network space, and then we're going to put in IP information. So if we put in 10.0.0.0, and we only cared about matching on that first 10, meaning, OK, Mr. Router, any interfaces you have that begin with the IP address of 10 anything, go ahead and include those. We could do that by simply saying 10.0.0.0. And then we care about the first matching number, the first octet, but we don't care about the second octet, and we don't care about the third octet, and we don't care about matching on the fourth octet. So those are referred to as wildcard bits or part of a wildcard mask. And what this does in measurable terms, it says any interfaces, Mr. R1, begin with 10, include them in OSPF. And any other interfaces that don't begin with 10, do not include them in OSPF. And then regarding those interfaces that match this network statement, what area of OSPF do you want to include those networks in? And so we're going to say area zero. We could carve up networks with OSPF into multiple areas. For CCNA, we're focused on single area or the backbone area only. So we're going to use area zero consistently. So check this out. I've hit the up arrow key a few times. I'm going to do a show IP OSPF interface. And look at this. 
I'll hit spacebar and then we'll scroll through. So this is showing us with this command, show IP OSPF interface, that gig zero zero, it's now participating in OSPF. And that's because that interface has an IP address that started with 10 and the network statement said 10 anything. And if we scroll down, here we have gig zero one, which also began with 10. It's also included in OSPF and gigabit zero slash two, which is this interface between R1 and this router up here on the left, which is R3. That's also enabled for OSPF. But what didn't get included in OSPF was the loopback interface, not because it's anti-loopback, <laughs> but rather because the loopback interface did not start with a 10. It started with a one. So if we do a do show IP interface brief, you notice here we have loopback zero that I was on this router and it's not participating in that logical layer three interface loopback zero. It's not participating in OSPF because the first octet didn't match. So what we could do is we could add another network statement for that, say network, and let's go ahead and do 1.1.0.0. And just for grins, let's imagine that we want to match on the first two octets and don't care about the last two. That for the wildcard bits for the first two octets would do it. And then if you don't care about the third, don't care about the fourth, and then we'll put that in area zero as well. So the secret is the network statement just says what we're looking for as far as an IP address on any interfaces. And then once those interfaces are enabled, those interfaces are gonna bring to the table whatever subnet they're connected to. So right here on gig zero two, look at this. That's the 10.12.0 network based on the mask. Also, if you need a tutorial on subnetting and variable length subnet masking, check out my series. It's 11 videos long right here on YouTube. It is uh, the subnet Saturdays. It'll walk you through the whole process. So once again, the network statements that we're issuing are just to say yes or no to an interface to whether or not it should participate in OSPF. And then once it is, whatever that network is, it's directly connected to whatever that mask length is, that's going to be included in OSPF, regardless of you know, how many wildcard bits we used in this network statement. So think of the network statement as, hey, which interfaces should be included? And then once they're included, the interfaces and their actual networks they're connected to are then participating in OSPF and being advertised in OSPF. So we'll press enter here. And then if we hit the up arrow key a few times for show IP OSPF interface, now we also have loopback zero, which also got included because its first two octets, first two numbers of its IPv4 address match the network statement. So it said, boom, I'm in. And also it knew that it was in area zero because that's part of the network statement that we used. Now there is another option besides a network statement that we can use to go into interface configuration to enable OSPF just on an interface. But the key part I wanna share with you from an OSPF perspective for CCNA is the network statement. I wanna make sure you're comfortable with how that works. So labbing it up and practicing with it will help you with that. All right, so if we go to our three-step process for getting OSPF working, we've run OSPF, fantastic. We added interfaces. We did it with a network statement in a router config. And the third step, D, it could be for discover, that works, or establish dynamic neighbors. So in this case, R1 right now on all three interfaces is super curious about who else is out there. <laughs> I mean, he would love to become a neighbor with R2. He would love to become a neighbor with R3. But the problem is R2 and R3 are not running OSPF and they don't have any interfaces enabled for OSPF. And so R1 is like singing this song like, all by myself, I'm running OSPF all by myself. And it's very lonely because he's not learning anything. He's not learning about information from any other router, about how to reach networks, but he's willing to because he's rad. He's running OSPF, interfaces have been enabled, and he is willing to discover and build dynamic neighbors so he can share information. So I suggest we give him a neighbor. Let's go up to R2. And here in R2, let me go ahead and make that a little bit bigger so we can read that. So here in R2, the first thing I'm gonna do is do a show CDP neighbors just to verify where things are connected. So R2 off of its gig zero zero interface is where that 1012 network is. And we can also do a show IP interface brief just to verify our IP addressing, fantastic. So what we'll do is we'll do the RAD process here on R2. One way of verifying if we have routing protocols already in place is show IP protocols, nothing there. Show IP OSPF, nothing there. Great, so no routing protocols at the moment. So let's run OSPF. We'll go into configuration mode, router, OSPF, and then we'll give it a process ID. Now the process ID doesn't have to match other routers. Uh, that's one of the elements that's just local. It's like the, it's instance of OSPF that's running. We need to give it a number. So we could use one or seven or 20. It's just local to this router. So let's go ahead and pick six, seven, eight, three, just because we can and press enter. We're now in router configuration mode, boom. Now, while we're here at step number one, when we run OSPF, it's actually going to pick a router 
ID. Now the router ID, it looks like an IPv4 address, feels like an IPv4 address, but it's really just a number that's formatted like an IPv4 address. And it's a router ID, and every router running OSPF, if it wants to work correctly, needs to have one. And so here's how R2 decided on which router ID it should use. The first thing it said was, is the router ID configured? <laughs> and because we just started OSPF, uh, we could go in here and say router ID and specify what the router ID is. But because we just started it, uh, there is no configured router ID. But if there was a configured router ID and this router was brought up, it would use that configured router ID for OSPF. But that's not there, so we'll cross that off the list. The next, it's going to ask itself, do I have any loopback interfaces? And if so, what is the highest IP address on a loopback. And so if we had 10 or 20 or 30 loopbacks for some weird reason, <laughs> whichever of those loopbacks had the highest IP address numerically, IP-wise, uh, that would be used, that same IP address would be used as the router ID. And check this out, we have a loopback here on router two. Its IP address is 2222, that's the only loopback, and that's what it's gonna choose right there as the router ID. Now, if this did not have a loopback, the third choice, it doesn't like doing it, but it will, is what is the highest highest IP address on a layer three interface that's currently active when OSPF comes up. So if this loopback hadn't been there, it would have chosen one of these numbers. So that's the decision process it went through. So let's verify that it actually picked the router ID that we expected it to. We'll do a do show IP OSPF. And I move that out of the way. Look at this right there. There's our routing process, process ID 6783. And there's the router ID right there. And that's because it chose the highest IP address on any existing loopback interface when OSPF came up. And because the loopback was 2222, that's the router ID. Now, the next thing about this rad process for getting OSPF working is we need to add some interfaces because R2 right now, it's running OSPF, but it's not allowing any interfaces and their directly connected networks to play the game. So R2 is never going to form a neighborship with R1 because this interface, gig0 slash 0 right here, is not enabled for OSPF. So it's not sending hello messages or being able to discover R1 because this interface is not enabled. So the second step here is to add interfaces. And let's add some interfaces. So one way of adding interfaces, we're in router configuration already, would be to use network. And then we could say 0000, 000 space 255.255.255.255. .255 .255 .255. Like that, and what that basically says is we don't care about what the IP address is in the first octet or second octet or third octet or fourth octet, and that's why we just zero these out because it doesn't matter what's there. It's basically saying any interfaces that have an IPv4 address, you're included. And so we'll go ahead and add those into area zero. And now if we do a do show IP OSPF interface, it's gonna have all of the interfaces. So I'm gonna go ahead and verify that real quick. So this is gig zero zero, yes. And then gig01, yes. <laughs> and then the loopback, yes. And look at that, we just formed a neighborship between us and R1, which is great news. Because that's our third step in RAD, in the OSBF. So we should probably talk about neighbors for a moment. Now, these two routers are now OSPF neighbors. And what that means is that R1 is sharing everything it knows about its directly connected networks with R2. And R2 is sharing everything it knows about its directly connected networks with R1. And as we add other routers to the mix, those advertisements regarding what they know about will also be propagated all the way through our, what they call a routing domain, this group of routers, so that when we're done, every single router has information from every other router about what they're directly connected to. And it's a lot like having a map with a lot of little pieces that every router now has a full copy of, and it can determine, oh, you need to get to this network, I know how to get there based on all the information of all the directly connected networks that are being advertised by all the routers. And that information from each router is being propagated to all the other routers in this area. So let's talk for a moment about what it takes to become a good neighbor. And I'd like to think about somebody who's been in the sun and his name is Matt. And because Matt's been in the sun, he is tan. So if you wanna call him Matt is tan, or if you wanna call him tan, Matt, and Matt Franco, I work with somebody named Matt Beecher who uh, has one T in his name, so that works. So if you remember Tan Matt or Matt Tan, either way you want to do it, that's going to help you remember the elements which have to be agreed to in order for two routers to become OSPF neighbors. So let's take a look at what has to be in agreement for R1 and R2 to become neighbors, as we just saw happen from this console message. And the T is for timers. 
So there's timers involved with OSPF. One of those timers is like the hello interval. How, how frequently is a router running OSPF on an enabled interface? How often is it going to say, send a little hello message? And if that doesn't match, if the timers do not match, they just won't like each other. Think of it like, oh, I'm not going to become a neighbor with that guy. His timers are different by even one second. I'm not going to do it. So timers have to match if we want neighborships, if we want a neighborship to work. The A is for the area, specifically the area number. So in R2 and R1, when they're saying their little messages back and forth, if they don't both agree that this 10, 12 network that they're commonly connected to, if they don't both agree that it's area zero or whatever area we've configured, they won't become neighbors. They're just going to hang it up and say, whoop, nope, nope, you don't agree. Something's wrong. I'm not going to become a neighbor. The N is for the network address. Think of a network address like a street name. So this street name is 10.12.0 with the 24-bit mask. And if R2 thinks it's a 23-bit mask and R1 thinks it's a 25-bit mask, or if they think it's a different IP network, like the actual numbers are different, either way, if they don't agree on that network address, they will not become neighbors. They're going to say, nope, 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 not going to be a neighbor with you. You don't think this street is named 10.12.0. And as a result, they won't become neighbors if they don't agree on the IP network address that they share in common. The M is for the maximum transmission unit. So if we're using the defaults, it shouldn't be a problem. So if we do a show interface for gig 00 and gig 02 here, they would show the MTU. In fact, hey, we have an interface right here. Let's do it. So if we do a show interface gig 0 slash 0 and press enter, and let me scroll down so we have it in frame. See right here, it says the MTU is 1500 bytes. That's the MTU for the interface. So they have to agree on the maximum transmission unit. So if you're using the defaults on similar devices, by George, it's probably just going to work. Probably going to be the same. However, if you have a situation where you have a, a router and it's neighboring up or trying to neighbor up with a multi-layer switch and they have like 1504 instead of 1500, that could be an issue. So the MTU needs to match if they want to become neighbors. The next A, so there's an area number up here. The next A is authentication. Now, by default, we're not using authentication. And if they both agree, yeah, no, no authentication required, we're good. However, if one side is requiring a password, for example, and using authentication of a certain type, the other side to become a neighbor has to match that authentication. And the last T here is the type. And I'm going to refer to the network. In fact, the OSPF network type. And they need to agree. And it basically boils down to this. There's some defaults in place. If we're using Ethernet networks from an OSPF perspective, by default, these devices on Ethernet think that the network type is called broadcast. A broadcast that implies that if they send a hello message to the well-known address, the multicast address for OSPF, they're just thinking and believing that everybody on that network segment is going to have the opportunity of seeing that. And they can do dynamic discovery of neighbors. So if they both think it's a type broadcast, we're good to go. If we went in and we manually messed it up and we said that on R2, the OSPF network type is P2P for point to point and not broadcast. Those two neighbors, if they don't agree on that OSPF network type, are not going to form an adjacency and have a successful neighborship. So whenever you think about discovering dynamic neighbors, just go ahead and maybe write this down a few times, tan mat or Matt's tan, or whatever you want to do. And just remind yourself that there's six major elements that need to match and be agreed to for these two OSPF devices to become neighbors. And just to confirm those for a moment, let's go ahead here in R2, we'll do a show IP OSPF interface for gig zero slash zero. And let me just hide the writing for just a moment. So for the timers, here's the row for the timers for this interface. This is R2 we're looking at. Here's the area number. Here is the network address the 10, 12, 0, based on the mask. The MTU we looked at earlier with the show interface is 1500 by default. The network type, because it's Ethernet, the default is broadcast, which they both agree to. And the one command that we can't see based on the show IP OSPF interface, we can see the show IP OSPF and just press enter. And this is showing us that for this backbone area, area 0, that the area is not using authentication. And that's why they're in compliance with each other. So on R2, because it's neighboring with R1 and R1 is connected to the 1010 network, if we do a show IP route, this is going to show us the entire IPv4 routing table. Look at this. We have learned about some networks. We've learned about the 1013 network, which is what R1 is connecting over to R2 with. And look at this. In fact, we can just tag on show IP route OSPF, and that'll show us just the OSPF learned routes. 
So this is saying on R2, I know how to reach 1111, which is the loopback that R1 is including in OSPF. It knows how to reach 1010, which is this gig 00 connected network on R1, which R1 is advertising to R2. And also it knows how to reach 10130, which is this other interface that R1 is using to connect up to R3. And all those three routes are now being advertised via OSPF to R2. So R2 knows about all those advertisements from R1, knows all about its directly connected networks. And that's how these routes are being added into the routing table. Also, if we go to R1, and on R1, if we do a show IP route for OSPF, it knows about the 1023 network because R2 is directly connected to that. And it also knows about R2's loopback interface, which is 2222. So here is what I propose we do. Let's get out Notepad and let's put OSPF on all the routers for all interfaces. So to do that, we'll do config T and router OSPF. I'll use process ID one and we'll say network 0000, and then a wildcard mask that says, we don't care about what the IP address actually is, as long as you have one, include that interface. And we'll say area zero, and then we'll type in end. I'm gonna copy that. We already have OSPF configured on router one and router two. Let's go ahead and put this on all the other routers. So there's router three, right click and paste, done. Router four, right click and paste, and router five, Right click and paste. And then I'm going to use this really cool feature in Packet Tracer. It's the time warp. Let's do the time warp again. So it's, it's jumping 30 seconds every time we click that down there, which is fantastic. Let everything converge. So now if we go back to R1, effectively R1 is going to have information because propagated through the entire network, he's going to have information about what is R5 connected to, what's R4 connected to, what's R3 connected to, etc. And having all the puzzle pieces, like all the pieces of the map, it can then learn how to reach every network in our topology because all the routers are connected to at least one of those networks and they're sharing that information. So here in R1, if we do a show IP route and I'm gonna type, and I'm gonna tag on OSPF just so we can limit the output to just OSPF learned routes. Look at this. We know how to get the loop back on R2, the loop back on R3, the loop back on R4, the loop back on R5. We also know how to get to the 1023 network. Look at that, because it's right here and we have two paths to get there through R2 and R3, and they're both the same cost, uh, we have equal cost load balancing. So we have two paths to get to the 1023 network. Then we also know about the 1034 network, which is right here, and also the 1045 network, which is right here, and also the 23.1.2 network, which is the one out here. So let's do a quick summary about the pieces involved. To get OSPF up and running, it's rad! Just remember that. We have to run OSPF, we have to add interfaces, and then dynamically build and establish neighbors that we can then share routing information with. If we wanna be a good neighbor, we have to agree on six things. And those six things are 10 mat. I would encourage you to practice writing those out. And also in Packet Tracer, do the show commands that I did in this video to help reinforce where those parameters are. And if they don't match, if even one of those doesn't match, they will not become OSPF neighbors. Or if they were OSPF neighbors, and you change one of those parameters, they are no longer gonna be neighbors. They're gonna give up on the neighborship. Also with a router ID, we talked about the method that the router ID is selected with a configured router ID first. By default, there isn't one. So then if that wasn't present, it would then default to the highest IP address on a loopback interface. If there's no loopbacks, it's the highest IP address on an active interface when OSPF is first started. And if there is none, Let's say you have a brand new router, no IP addresses anywhere, no loopbacks, no configured router ID. It's going to bark, Rah! I can't start OSPF right because I don't have a router ID. It'll actually give you that message. So in this experiment for our office hours, what I'm going to do is this is going to go live at 10 o'clock Pacific time on Saturday. And then right after that, right after this concludes, we'll continue the discussion on the Discord server in the office hour room. And so any of the videos in this playlist for the office hour Feel free to take questions from any of these videos on any of the CCNA basic topics that we're talking about right here, and then bring them. And you can get in the voice chat room on Discord, and we can have a discussion about it and lab it up and answer your questions. I wish you the best of success in your journey in the world of CCNA and beyond. If you haven't yet done so, subscribe. It's free. My name is Keith Barker. Welcome to the channel, and I look forward to seeing you, my friend, in the next event. Until then, have a great day, be kind to everybody, and keep on studying. Bye for now.